Well, good afternoon if you are in the eastern part of the United States. Good evening if you are in Europe. Buonasera if you're in Italy and also Africa. And good overnight if you're in parts of Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. And hello in Hawaii, whatever time it is. I'm Fred Plotkin. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Idajo, as you know, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. On this Friday program, I always have someone who either I know very well, I know a little bit, I don't know it all personally, but people who are doing fascinating things, usually in music, but also visual arts and writing and journalism and so on. And the fellow I have today, the maestro that I have today, excuse me, maestro, is Leonardo Benazzi, who joins us from his home in Parma, Italy. When you say Parma to people, you might think of prosciutto, you might think of Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, you might think of fabulous food, you might think of certain filmmakers and designers and, and culture and art and Maria Luigia and elegance. But above all, I think we think of two great musicians, Giuseppe Verdi, who was not from Parma, but nearby, and Arturo Toscanini, who was born in Parma on the banks of the river. And Leonardo was born in Parma. Tell me exactly where in Parma you were born and what part of the city you live in. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, being your guest, Fred, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, well, I was actually born in, um, in the very center of the city. Uh, it was uh, nearby a park uh, which was called uh, Cittadella. And um, it was actually very close to uh, the, the main area which Maria Luigia built in the, in the, the beginning of its um, you know, legacy. And um, it's very center place. And I was actually quite close to the Toscanini house as well. I know exactly where that is. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about Maria Luigia and the Farnese family and, and about the history of Parma and why it's always said that even though Italy is a very elegant country, maybe the most elegant city and people are the people of Parma. You're the first person, for example, who I've had who's wearing suspenders, beautiful Bordeaux colored suspenders. And there is something in Parma. They eat well, but they also dress well and they smell good and a certain lavender fragrance. There's something particular in your city. And a lot of it goes back to Maria Luigia and before that, the Farnese family. Yeah, I think it's also, uh, you know, the way why, uh, if you think about Stendhal, for example, he was very fascinated about the city, you know, he, when he wrote uh, The Red and uh, The Black, um, he was fascinated about, uh, the theater, he was fascinated about the, the city and uh, the food, of course, as well, the costumes and the people. Um, I think nowadays something is still uh, um, resuming from that, from that period. Um, Something else is quite missing though. And uh, I think it is one of the reasons why Parma should take uh, back its, uh, its legacy uh, to, um, to the, you know, the present days uh, in, a, in a better way, I think, because you know, we, we miss it actually a lot. And um, you know, even culturally speaking, uh, Parma, as you said in the introduction very well, um, gave us uh, many other artists in, the, in, the, you know, in, the, in other fields, like for example, movie making, we got Bertolucci, and uh, many, many filmmakers or important uh, artists or intellectual people. Uh, that's, that's very interesting. Well, for a long time, Maria Luigi, if I remember, was French. She was Marie Louise. And there was a period before Parma joined the Risorgimento and became part of the Republic of Italy, in which there was this French influence in Parma, sure. which imparted a certain kind of taste and a certain sound to the accent that makes it different from Modena and Bologna just down the road. Um, I remember how much butter I saw on tables in Parma, which is something you just don't see in most of Italy except at breakfast. There were these small details. The um, scent of, of lavender 
is everywhere. And the violets, the people of the city have this elegance in their shops. The shop windows are beautifully designed. The yeah. Farnese family before, before that, and we know the name Farnese from the second act of Tosca, that's where it takes place in Rome, but the Farnese were great art collectors. And there is the Teatro Farnese, the theater, and the National Gallery of Parma. It's, it's called the Pinacoteca, I think, is a magnificent collection. There's the famous Parmigianino, but there are so many more painters there that if, if a major city in the United States or Germany or not Spain, but maybe Spain too, had that museum, it would be a magnet for tourists just for the museum, for nothing else. But yeah. in Italy, that's so rich in paintings and visual arts, it's just another wonderful museum. And there are churches in Parma with amazing art. And Parma also was one of the four cities in Italy to have the original music conservatories. And those were Milan, Parma, Naples, and Palermo. And what's particular about the conservatory in Parma is that because Parma was under French rule and Napoleon closed all the convents and all the monasteries, the music conservatory in Parma, where I've worked, is a former monastery. So the practice rooms and the coaching rooms are little cells where the monks used to live. And it has a beautiful inner courtyard. It kind of perfectly adapted to go from a monastery to a music conservatory. Absolutely. It's yeah, it's quite, quite a, it's, it's perfectly. Likewise, the, the Milano Conservatory as well. I mean, the, the structure is very similar. And um, the, the fascinating thing is that uh, even when I studied there in my, you know, my, my, my years as a student, um, I was feeling actually that, that, that sense of the presence of, you know, uh, the past and that presence of the, the church in, in a way during, during those years and uh, that sense of uh, protection that the structure gave us. Uh, from the external world, which uh, which was uh, I think very important uh, for my studies, because um, we were feeling like a, a single group, and we were actually protected by the external world. And uh, during those years when you were so young, you need that kind of protection from the external world. I think it's very important. And uh, also when I started making music with the with the young orchestras inside the, the conservatory, that sense of um, the past, that sense of the history and the tradition was very, very strong. And uh, it helped us uh, very much for our careers, I think, you know. Uh, and I want to point out to listeners that the four conservatories, Milan, Naples, Palermo, and Parma, the other three are very, very large cities. Parma is a small city. It's an elegant, lovely little town. It's not a small town, but it's a city, a misura, a misura di uomo. In other words, it's sure. human-sized city. And you could walk the whole city in about an hour, basically. Whereas yeah. Milan and Naples and Palermo are huge. And therefore, the presence of the music conservatory in Parma is much more felt. You see the young students coming out of the conservatory, walking through the streets with their instruments, singing the melodies that they may have just learned. The fact that the conservatory is maybe a 10 minute walk at most from the Tatra Reggio and another five minute walk from the Tatra Fortunese, the historic theater, means that anyone who walks on the main streets of central Parma immediately encounters music. And bookshops have images of Verdi and Toscanini and others right on the river remind me the name of the river i forgot it's actually parma it's um it's, it's parma, parma river. river okay is the hotel toscanini um and the uh trattoria right there is it corriere i'm forgetting the name now it's a good trattoria but between the hotel and the music conservatory everything is close yeah 
Um, sorry, you have, sorry. still have record shops in Parma, which is something you don't see in most places, selling recordings and many books about music. Parma has wonderful bookshops. And I buy a lot of my music related books in Parma because they're easier to get than even Milan or, or elsewhere in Italy. Um, so therefore the concentration of culture and the focus on culture reflects, it feels like Vienna in a way, Vienna where everybody can talk about music, except that it's in a smaller scale. And when you were a small child, and I mean in elementary school and, and middle school, were music, was music part of the instruction and part of the conversation? Uh, very much so. Uh, and I would say actually um, that for a child who is interested in music, Parma does help you a lot uh, because you feel like a sponge sometimes. And uh, when you walk uh, around the streets, uh, through the streets, um, you can, as you said before, you can you can hear sometimes the sound of the instruments from the conservatory, or you can hear um, the sound of the singers from the Teatro Reggio who are singing Verdi. And uh, you know that uh, that feeling of absorbing music. Uh, from my remembrance, of course, which uh, is, is just one case, but uh, it was very present. And I, I, I have very strong memories about uh, that period when I was uh, a kid, uh, five years old, six years old, walking through the streets and uh, listening weird music. So that kind of um, exposure to that, to that word um, got into my DNA in some ways. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I started this path. Otherwise, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have done so. Um, yes, um, I really agree with what you said. Uh, everything is is um, is art in Parma. Everything is culture. Um, it's uh, it's always fascinating uh, talk about this because sometimes uh, the real values of the Parma culture are quite misunderstood, in my opinion. Um, it's always uh, remembered for uh, for um, its uh, nice. Uh, buildings and uh, the fog you know the, the food but there is much more in in that in uh, in this city to learn about for example the influences from um, uh, from ancient cultures which uh, inspired the Benedetto Antelani which was the the sculpture of um, of Duomo and the Battistero in Parma uh, so the external the external sculptures were made by Benedetto Antelani and uh, he had this kind of um, Middle Eastern uh, um, inspirational word to, to take from and um, I think the Parma uh, culture is much more than what is described nowadays and I would like to you know with you maybe find out uh, find out uh, this this very little details about about the city and even in music we've got many other influences not only Verdi we've got uh, other composers uh, after him we've got uh, Il Brando Pizzetti we've got uh, Apaer um, you know, I think uh, it's a it's a very unexplored um, musical world that we have to do nowadays. Especially the younger generations should uh, start to take um, confidence with these composers because they are quite important, even in the opera world. Uh, Pizzetti, for example, um, took uh, Verdi operas for a for a complete uh, regeneration uh, inside his compositions. And uh, when you actually play those compositions, you can you can find how much uh, inside he was within the Verdi music. He, he really knew that. He really studied it. So I don't think. Uh, I mean, some some kind of uh, critical word um, divided uh, these two two words. Uh, you know, the the modern music and uh, so the Pizzetti and uh, Casella, those composers from the opera and it was quite a, a breakup, a very strong breakup, but I don't think these two words are so distant from each other. I uh, think there's good music and there's the other kind. Exactly. And we know good music. Was Casella from Parma? Um, no, Casella wasn't from Parma, but- um, you I know, thought it was from Torino. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I wanna continue a little bit more about your city because you obviously are at home there, and I've been fortunate to be there a lot. But um, you mentioned a moment ago about the fog in Parma. Yes. La nebbia. 
And I mentioned that the city, a lot of the buildings have a very particular yellow color mm -hmm. called Parma yellow, Giallo di Parma. And this color was chosen by Maria Luigia and it's sort of the color of an egg yolk. And the reason that so many buildings in the center of Parma are that color is because you could see them in the fog because the fog used to be so dense, it's a little less so now. But when I was a young man, I went to Parma in the 1970s. Um, yes, it was a very thick fog. And you would sort of walk along the streets. Bologna has a lot of fog, but they have portici, porticos, so you could be it's away from the traffic. Yeah, it's more brownish. Parma, only, only a little bit of porticos in the rebuilt center after the war but a lot of Parma does not have that. And I know too that in Parma, if you want to repaint your house, you have to get permission <laughs> from the city before you can repaint your house because they maintain that color and that visual integrity, which is so particular to the city. When I'm in Parma, I know I could not be anywhere else but Parma. And that's particular. So I remember too, that a lot of the people in the city have an accent that's a little different from Bologna, which is where I learned my Italian. And you say Perma instead of Parma. Yeah. Are there other sounds and words in Parma speech that's different from other Italian? Uh, I think so, pretty much so. Um, you know, I, I have many examples of, uh, of uh, different words from, from the, the Italian and the other close by cities. Uh, I think the main difference is uh, between Parma and Reggio Emilia, which is the closest one. Um, which is 22 uh, kilometers away. Yes, exactly, <laughs> something about this. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's always astonishing to see how much um, fraction and um, struggle there is between uh, the, the population of these two cities. And uh, I, I never understood why. I mean, we are so close in many ways. Um, I think Reggio Emilia is a fascinating town, for example, even the, the center is, is very interesting. The Teatro Valli is, is one of the, the best theaters in, in, in Italy, in my opinion. It's where Luciano Pavarotti made his debut in 1961. His first exactly. opera performance was in Reggio Emilia. Um, I wanted to say something in defense of Reggio Emilia. I can say a lot about Reggio Emilia. There is the famous Aceto Balsamico, Tradizionale, this is what we call traditional balsamic vinegar. And it's made in two places, Modena and Reggio Emilia. Yeah. And then there's the cheese, the Parmigiano Reggiano. Reggiano meaning from Reggio. So while Parma has the cheese and Modena has the aceto balsamico, only Reggio Emilia has both. But everybody forgets Reggio Emilia. Reggio Emilia also has, it's considered to have the best early educational system in the world. Absolutely. So people come from all over the world to study early childhood education in Reggio Emilia. So another jewel on the Via Emilia, which is this road of goes to Emilia Romagna that has all of these great cities. Yeah. Um, but can you give a couple of words that are very Parma? Um, yes, it's... Um... Cofet, which means uh, how do you do? How are you doing? Cofet? Cofet, yes. I never knew that. Okay. And Sperema um, B, uh, which means uh, we are hoping yeah. that it's going to be fine. Uh, yeah. You know, it's going to be fine or something like this. Uh, it's a very peculiar um, word in, uh, in Parma. And uh, we, we tend to use that a lot during our conversations. Um, I think uh, one of the most fascinating places in, uh, in the town is actually um, a food place. Maybe you know it. It's, uh, it's called Pepin. Um, <laughs> and it's where um, the owners, uh, uh, you know, still nowadays are, are talking the very original uh, Parma dialect. And you can, uh, you can, you can hear the, the, the original one there. It's, uh, I think, one of the very few places still uh, existing in, uh, in the town where you can uh, have this experience, aside from the great food, of course. So it's easy when we talk about Parma to say that it has great food and leave it at that. But 
I think it creates a sensibility among the people that they're not fanatical, but they are knowledgeable and they know good food when they see it. And when the European Union was forming all of its different capital cities to guide policy, I remember that the choice was between Parma and Helsinki, Finland for food. Now, Helsinki has great food, actually. I don't want to give them a bad impression. I love the food in Helsinki, but it's not Parma in terms of the innate knowledge of uh, agriculture, the relationship of the land, of farming and so on, because you see this beautiful city, but then right around it is farmland that grows extraordinary things. And Parma has right. industrial agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of tomatoes. They have uh, the Barilla Pasta Company. They have huge industry. They have Parmalat, which is a dairy firm. But in addition, there are many, many small producers of all kinds of things. Yeah. And you'll see why I'm going to that in a moment. I think that Helsinki should have been given water to be responsible for because Finland takes very good care of its water, which is a huge issue as well. But my question is, if people in Parma are so knowledgeable about food and quality, how does that affect their perspective of music and of journalism? You have the oldest newspaper in Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. Gazzetta di Parma? Yes, it's one of the, the local... Uh, the, the, yeah, it's the, the oldest newspaper in Italy. Ancient one, yeah. Uh, that means people are reading a lot longer and, <laughs> and talking about news and ideas because you have that old newspaper. Um, as people from Parma, how, do you, how does that affect your senses, your judgment, your aesthetic connection to the world? I think it's a very fascinating question, Fred. Um, I would answer saying this uh, and recollecting with what you said before. Um, when we speak about Parma, we don't speak just about uh, us specializing in one field, but it's uh, the collection of many other skills, like for example, agriculture, as you said, and um, industry, those um, skills are all linked together. And I think the, the Parma citizen uh, grows up, uh, you know, very um, surrounded by, by these words. And uh, he learns very early to connect uh, uh, different words. And he knows that you can't make good food without uh, good conditions. You can't make good food without uh, um, good agriculture, which means uh, respect for nature, which means uh, uh, respect for environment uh, and for animals. So uh, I think it's uh, the word that the, the, the key word here is culture. And um, culture is not just about reading books. Culture is, is in everywhere, I think. Uh, culture is in, in food, as you said. Culture can be in agriculture as well uh, or in, uh, in the industry. Making, making things good and with respect for what you're doing. This is very important. When you see a company like Barilla and um, you can pretty much see how well they work from their uh, respect and uh, eye for the detail, for, uh, for you know, this, uh, these very important details when making food, when making pasta, is, um, everything is, uh, is done very well and uh, always with uh, an eye for detail. And there's another thing that I think connects to all of this, and I'm not exaggerating. People may think I'm doing this, but I'm not exaggerating. Because so many foods in Parma take time to prepare, there's not fast food, really. A prosciutto has to hang for 14 months. That's a leg of pork. Um, the Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese... 18, 24, 36 months of aging. The aceto balsamico, which is not from Parma, but that it could be 10, 15, 25 years. The relationship to time and the necessity of waiting, of being patient, of being focused, of keeping your eye on what's important, 
I know that in many years, I don't know if they still do this, but in Parma, when someone makes a wheel of Parmigiano Reggiano, there are banks in Parma that have refrigerated rooms and the cheese producer brings his cheese to those rooms. He gets a loan from the bank because the cheese may take three years to mature. And this is part of his income. And then the bank owns part of the cheese when it's sold. And a portion of that money is taken and given to cultural activities in Parma. So that when we eat a piece of cheese or have some prosciutto di Parma, we are also supporting the arts, which I think is a very enlightened thing to do. And my question simply is, as a boy, did your parents or did your teachers instill in you the value of patience, of patience? Or were you eager and in a hurry, the way you might be in Naples where everything is, is brigativo, where you, they're very spontaneous and energetic, and I love Naples, but it's a very different feeling from Parma. No, I think it's very, very much the first, uh, the first, as you said, um, patient was was the key of my my whole career and of my whole life in a way. Um, not only because of the music, but as you said, uh, because of the cultural influences from my parents and um, and my even my grandparents. Uh, I started this path um, because my my grandfather um, introduced me to the listening of great cultural. Uh, musical culture figures of the past, uh, like Carian or uh, Toscanini, for example, Verdi in the, in the theater. And uh, he never said to me, you have to be there at that level tomorrow. He always said to me, um, absorb and listen and study. So these, these three words were actually my mantra for, the, for, for my whole professional life. And I still keep, um, doing this suggestion nowadays. Um, when you think about the Verdi careers, uh, for example, and it took 40 years to perfectize his, his craft, you know, even in the opera making, we don't have uh, um, a first Verdi or a final Verdi. It's the only one Verdi, I think. Of course, we have differences in, uh, in his operas, but it's because he's improving. And each opera is a step uh, further for perfectizing his craft. And you can pretty much see from, from, uh, from the early operas to the last ones. Um, he has a very deep respect for, for learning and for, for, uh, for learning music. Uh, each day he was, he was waking up and studying and working on, uh, on, on his operas and on the links between words and music. Um, I'm going to get so, to that more. I want to, of course, want to focus on Verdi and Toscanini with you. But um, it's a key point that you were making about keeping on working and perfecting and getting better. Uh, I'm not bragging, but I'll just remark about this. Probably the best compliment I ever got was from a man who had a very important position at the Metropolitan Opera. And after I left the Met to work elsewhere and remain contact with the Met, of course, about 25 years after I left the Met, I was working and performing in front of an audience. And this gentleman said to my mother who was there, Fred keeps getting better and better. And that was such a compliment because that's my goal yeah. is to not be as good as I was 10 months ago or 10 years ago, but to keep refining and working, it's kind of like, I'm not calling myself Michelangelo, but the way Michelangelo would work on marble more and more and more and just Absolutely. little fine details and Verdi would go through the score and change from a natural to a sharp if he felt that it was dramatically more effective. I'll only add further is that everyone who knows me knows that I say that my two favorite composers are Berlioz and Rossini, but my hero is Verdi because I love Verdi's music. I love Verdi's operas. I think with everybody, it's chemical, it's physical that we feel one composer or another in a particular way. And I certainly feel Verdi, but I feel more Rossini and Berlioz. But as a man, 
to me, he is my hero in all public life. He and Nelson Mandela and just a few other people um, because of his greatness as a man. So I hear his greatness in his music. And so let's get into him a bit. Obviously, you grew up in, I'll call it Minestra di Verdi, Verdi Soup, where you were just completely immersed in it all the time. And it must have been natural to you, but also it could be overwhelming because it's such a wealth of riches. And when you decided to pursue a musical career, you began playing professionally at 13, I believe. And therefore, and conducting pretty young as well. And therefore, um, you had all of these riches. Was there one work that drew you in first about Verdi? Um, yes, I think that in my inner ear or something like this, I, the first memory I've got is, um, is Hernani. Uh, and uh, I, I also put uh, in the, into the listening suggestions this, this opera. Um, because it was the first one my grandfather um, suggested me to listen. And it was um, a beautiful recording uh, with the Italian um, um, Lyric Opera. Uh, yeah. It is a very old orchestra, which nowadays doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was conducted by Thomas Skippers. Uh, it, Schippers. I think it's Schippers. One of the, Schippers. Schippers, yes. Yep. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think he is one of the most uh, astonishing conductors we have in the history of conducting. And the way he conducts Verdi is, um, is so impressive in my opinion because um, it gives the real Verdi interpretation, the real Verdi sound, and that, that kind of very aggressive sound sometimes, um, but always keeping that roundness in the sound. Uh, it's never it's never um, high in temperature when you're listening to it, but it's very centered and you can feel the control. Uh, he never pushes the tempo, so it's very balanced and controlled. And I admire very much this conductor. Is uh, it's it's a misfortune that uh, he died so young, in my opinion. Yes, because he was, he for listeners, he was an American conductor who really began to have a huge success as a young man. When the new Metropolitan Opera House opened on September 16th, 1966, with Samuel Barber's uh, Antony and Cleopatra, it was Thomas Shippers who conducted and Franco Zeffirelli who designed and Justino Diaz and Leontine Price were Antony and Cleopatra. Um, Leontine Price is on this recording of Bernani along with Carlo Bergonzi. So tell us about Carlo Bergonzi as a Verdian, but also as a man from the province of Parma. Well, uh, what I have is memories from uh, Michele Pertusi, which uh, is a friend of mine, but also was um, a pupil of uh, Carlo Bergonzi when he was uh, almost like a kid. And uh, he always um, reminds and always um, put the accent on the fact that uh, he was such a, a kind man. Uh, he was very supportive for the people he loved. He never, he never um, set uh, up apart a person who loved or um, he never stopped uh, helping uh, people in, in troubles. So this is the first uh, thing that Michele always um, reminds me when he talks about him. Um, so I think that kind of human quality really um, merges out when you're listening to his voice. It's not, uh, it's not, it, I don't think it's, um, it's, um, it's something that uh, it cannot be explained, but actually depends from his human quality. And uh, when you listen to uh, other singers, for example, like Di Stefano, you can, you can feel this kind of um, very sensitive soul and uh, projection to help the other people, I think, and uh, take care and nurture them. But also Bergonzi was from Busetto, which is where Verdi was not born. He was born in nearby Roncoli, but he grew up in Busetto, about a three minute walk from where Bergonzi lives. 
-hmm. So I can imagine that although Parma is the capital of the province of where Verdi was born, but really Busetto is where Verdi lived and had his musical training. Um, so much of what happened in Verdi's young life happened in Busetto. And Bergonzi was from there and built a hotel and a restaurant called Idue Foscari, yeah. which is an early Verdi opera. And the restaurant was excellent. And part of the pleasure of studying with Carlo Bergonzi was you get to eat with Carlo Bergonzi. And I, my first cookbook, which I published in the 1980s, Carlo gave me a recipe called Caramelle okay. Verdi. Yeah. These are sort of wrappers that look like candies and they twist the yes. pasta wrapper like a candy wrapper, but inside was meat and cheese and spices. Yeah, they're very peculiar and, and, and quite good. I have to say. And he taught me how to make them in his kitchen. So not only was he one of the greatest singers, but he was a terrific cook and, and it's not for show. He didn't do that to be on television. He did it because he was anchored in that food tradition. And the agriculture there in Busetto is at the door of the city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You go a three minute walk outside of the little town of Busetto and there are farms. And there's the farm where Verdi grew up with his mother and father in Roncoli. And then there's the farm that he built in Santa Agata. And the reason I brought up agriculture earlier was that Verdi was not only a composer, he was a very famous farmer. Absolutely. And when you visit his home, you see his carriages, you see the plants that he planted. He was among the first people to plant certain plants in Italy. In the villa, yeah. In the, his villa. And there are lakes and he designed all of that and he raised um, pigs that became um, pork and prosciutto and so on. And there's a spalla shoulder called Spalla di San Secondo. And Verdi's Spalla di San Secondo was famous. And when he was trying to persuade a soprano to do what he wanted or an impresario, he would send a Spalla di San Secondo with his handwritten recipe to Cruda. persuade that person to do that. What were you saying? Uh, it was always Cruda because he suggested to cook afterwards. Yes. He sent yes. Spalla Cruda and uh, with the suggestion to cook it uh, at home. Yes, so it, uh, well, but he would send the recipe for how to cook it. And he made his own cheese. He made his own wine. And it was not like Richard Wagner who sort of built an estate. Verdi built a, a working farm and Verdi there were farm workers around there who had no medical care. Verdi built a hospital in the town of Villanova and brought in doctors from Bologna and other people from Milano and created this hospital. It was the first hospital for working people in Italy because they didn't have access to medical care. So yeah. Wagner built um, you know, theaters for himself and Verdi built hospitals and rest homes for retired singers and so on. He was that kind of man. Um, yes. and also, you can think about the, um, the Casa Riposo for uh, Musicisti in Milan. In Milan, yeah, on Piazza Michelangelo. Yes. Where I've been very fortunate to spend a lot of time and help out and work with a lot of the older people. And Verdi had this idea that um, he was fortunate in his life, but not everybody else was so fortunate and a retired instrumentalist or singer, sometimes a chorus member, um, might not be able to survive in old age. So he built this home, but he did not want it opened in his lifetime. He died January 27th of 1901, and it opened October 10th of 1902, October yes. 10th being his birthday. And it's a foundation. It still is there today. And I've been following it very closely during the pandemic. And they've done a wonderful job of protecting the old people who live there, very old okay. artists and singers, um, at a time when Milan was just completely devastated by COVID, by the coronavirus. And so all of this was Verdi's creation. He said about it, there was e la mia opera più bella, it's my most beautiful work, was actually this home. So. Yeah. They eat very well there. 
many composers um, in their own wills have left money to the Casa di Riposo. The, um, I'm trying to remember who wrote, Chilea wrote Adriana Le Couvreur. All the royalties from Adriana Le Couvreur go to the Casa di Riposo to take care of musicians. So it's, it's a really wonderful place. Um, when I turned 60, they said to me that I could come and live there too if I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite ready, but I think it's, it's quite early for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But um, so anyway, Verdi Ernani, I love that you mentioned that. It's his fifth opera. And I think he made great strides forward with that opera because. Before that, there were large tableau scenes in Nabucconi, Lombardi, and so on. But Ernani is really the first opera that creates a template for what followed. There are four principal characters, a soprano, a tenor, a baritone, and a bass. All of them have distinct musical personalities, but also distinct music, what Verdi called tinto, a color that you could almost associate with them. And he created great arias. Before that, the operas had dramatic scenes and it was melodramatic, and that's not a negative judgment. But with Hernani, based on a Victor Hugo story, um, he really moved forward. He started creating theater with Hernani. And I think it's a justly misunderstood and, and not seriously appreciated opera. So I was very impressed when you gave me your list of music to listen to for Idagio listeners, that that was the Verdi opera you picked. <laughs> um, talk more about your evolving relationship with Verdi, but also how I know you're eager to bring Verdi to young people. You're still young yourself but you are you have made it your mission to bring Verdi to even younger people and make them understand what makes Verdi special. What, in your view, makes him special and what's his appeal to young people? Well, uh, thank you for this question because actually um, it's, very, it's very important to me. Um, I think that the most um, astonishing thing about, about Verdi and studying him and his music is uh, actually finding out that is much more for young people than what uh, people tend to think. Um, the values that he always uh, uh, brings up in his operas are um, about relationships with uh, families, with father, with mother, or uh, sisters, siblings. Um, so this kind of um, sense of the family is always present. And uh, the, the sense of being somehow um, an outsider from from uh, from the mainstream world uh, for a younger uh, generations is nowadays very very important I think because many many young people feel uh, um, pushed aside from society and uh, I think it's pretty much the same where where you live in New York in the United States uh, as Italy as well doesn't make any difference uh, in the, the Western world. Um, younger people are, are pushed away from, from responsibility roles and Verdi as well during his first years when he, when he started his musical career was very much helped by Merelli which was the impresario at La Scala um, but uh, without him probably he never, he never would, wouldn't be able to, to get into this cultural world which was very narrow uh, for for every, even other artists at the time, so it was uh, it was very difficult for him to get into this uh, uh, high type society, uh, you know, very quite borghese and rich one in Milan at the time. So uh, he felt somehow the struggle of being uh, um, a farmer or a person who was coming from the countryside, uh, being put into big city where uh, nobles and uh, rich people were actually making their business and it was setting, uh, setting apart. Um, so these uh, this values and the relationship that Verdi has with society is always present in his operas. And Traviata is, uh, I think, the, the best example we have about this. And um, he, he was always very critical about uh, Borghese society, Borghese. In, in the English, we use the French word bourgeois. Bourgeois, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and uh, that's that's one of the reasons why I love Verdi so much because um, he he knows what he wants, you know, in a way. And even artistically, is uh, is always very um, honest with his uh, with his message, and even making mistakes sometimes because um, we have early operas which are, of course, um, we can we can say there are maybe not musically uh, astonishing, but he always does with uh, the maximum degree of honesty that he can do uh, at his level, you know, of learning. So um, Verdi is, uh, is, is an artist, but uh, he also knows uh, how to grow up uh, step by step. And uh, this kind of honesty is not always present in any composer. I think um, we, have, we have examples like Wagner, as you mentioned before, um, who wrote actually more words than, than notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, uh, there's some kind of, um, you know, aura that he was able to build and uh, he, to commercialize his, his, uh, his music making. He was a businessman and he was very doing what he was doing. I think where Verdi was uh, very connected with the agriculture and um, you know uh, that that farm farm making world uh, because he, he respected other things aside from music and respected the, um, his honesty, respected the the fact that music was not only the main passion of his life. So yeah, I think there are very fascinating. Um, topics to discuss. And how, practically, how do you introduce Verdi and his ideas to young people? Well, uh, first of all, I have a, I have a project which is, uh, is made with uh, Michele Pertusi, and we try to divulgate um, opera and uh, Verdi's opera to the younger generations. Uh, I think that the first step is actually to um, say to young generations that the Verdi music is not old, is is very, is very um, made for nowadays years, and they can even find uh, traces of the music they're listening nowadays, like popping music or stuff like this, uh, in 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 the Verdi operas. Uh, when you think about the Attila Prelude, for example, um, harmonically speaking, is like. Uh, a song uh, which could have been written in the 60s or the 70s, the 80s. You know, it's uh, it's really pop in their harmonies. Describe uh, that more uh, because that's fascinating to me. Um, what makes it like a song or music from the 1960s, 1970s or 1980s? Well, for example, are the, the um, tonicizzazione or the modulations from, uh, from, from a tonality to the other, um, getting from a very dark, dark tone to upper bright one uh, during the composition, and um, that that flowing melody is uh, also, I think, uh, taken up from um, uh, more earlier uh, Italian opera composers like uh, Leon Cavallo or Mascagni. Uh, it really sounds like uh, like Verista Verista opera. In a, in a way that that prelude, uh, in in terms of the harmonies and in terms of the melody, um, you know, it, it could be something like prelude from the Padrino or uh, or a movie Godfather, Godfather yeah. or Martin Scorsese movie by Godfellas or uh, you know something like this. And um, so I think is because during the time when he wrote that, so in the 80, 80 40, 46, Something like this. Uh, he was uh, he was very fascinated about um, finding new ways of expressing uh, the harmonies from from the German word without admitting so much because he was always very um, picky about uh, abandoning himself um, to this these theories coming from the from Germany and from Wagner and whatever. But his ears were always open and he was very modern. In, uh, in his writing, even even when he said, uh, "I'm not interested into this," but he was. Do you know the very specific reason that he wrote Attila in 1846? No, tell me. Um, northeastern Italy, all the way to Milan, and 
almost to Parma, but not quite because Parma was more French and Piacenza was French, but almost there, was under the Austrian Empire. Not yet Austro-Hungarian, just the Austrian Empire. Trieste was the seaport for Austria. And Venice was under Austria, unhappily under Austria. And the Austrians in 1846 built the railway bridge that still is there today between Mestre and the mainland and the Centro Storico, the old part of Venice. And they destroyed the neighborhood where the Santa Lucia train station is to build that bridge and to build a new train station. Before that, Venice was separated from the mainland entirely. And you could only get there by boat. And it was La Serenissima, it was a beautiful historic republic and so on. But this creation of that bridge meant that anyone could get to Venice by rail, by horse and cart, later by automobile, bicycle, and so forth. And to the Venetians, that was a great disaster because they were being compromised. They were being invaded by what they called the Uni, the Huns. And Attila, Attila, as we say in English, Attila the Hun was a symbol of invading Austria and sure. Austria coming to kill them, to take over Venice. And there's a character in the opera, a Roman named Ezio. And Ezio has the most famous line in the opera, which is, avrai tu l'universo me. In other words, you can have the universe, but let Italy be mine. That will be on my tombstone, by the way. <laughs> Those words. And when Verdi, with Piave, I believe it was, I'm not certain, but I think it was Piave who wrote the libretto, created that moment. The people in Teatro La Fenice cheered because there were Austrian occupiers all, all, all over the place, yeah. But hearing this opera set in ancient times, Attila, Attila, the Italians understood what Verdi was saying. So he was directly inspired by that railway bridge. And it's a story that's not often it's, told. And Verdi why. lived nearby in Venice when the opera was being produced. And he had a particular passion for oysters, Ostriche, because you couldn't get them in Parma. Mm -hmm. So he would eat oysters all the time while working on his music. And when the impresario wanted, of Venice wanted him to come back to do another opera, Rigoletto, he kept sending oysters to Parma, to, to Busetto, for Verdi. And that's why food was always central there, that Verdi could persuade with food and he could be persuaded with food. But it was very specifically that with Attila yeah. that changed a bit the commitment of the Risorgimento because 1846 was that, 1848 was the Great Rebellion and the Cinque Giornate in Milan, an attempt to rebel against Austria. But Verdi, as you well know, was really the leader of the Italian unification movement, Absolutely. as much as Cavour and Mazzini and the others, it was really Verdi with this opera. Yep. And we talk about Nabucco all the time, but to me, the one that was so influential was actually Attila. Yes, absolutely. For the reasons I just named. And one, one very interesting thing, if I can add something to your, to your speech, and which was beautifully descriptive, and um, it's that with Verdi, it's very important to um, remind that our cultural world, you know, as modern Italians, is actually coming from him and not uh, the opposite way. As, for example, um, you know, other other countries like Middle Eastern uh, Europe, like um, Polonia or um, you know, uh, Polish Poland, people, yeah. Poland, yes, um, that that you know, um, inspirational word for music was actually coming from the composer to the people, and not from the people, so the culture to the composers. Uh, when I told, when I think about. Um, you know, Smetana or this, uh, this you know, very uh, middle middle uh, European composers. Bohemia, yeah. yeah, exactly. You can you can feel that their music is coming from the culture that expresses them, 
And actually in Italy is quite the opposite because Verdi created the Italians and not the Italians created Verdi. So it's, um, it's a very um, touching point, I think, uh, because somehow our, uh, our national identity is, uh, is, is, is given by Verdi in, in many ways. And uh, that kind of respect we have for the nation nowadays is perhaps coming from him. That's why we took so many years to discover that we, we need to respect our country, that we need to love our country. I have this feeling of um, Italians that are you know, in love with their country quite uh, actually early in the, in the last years. I didn't have this, this feeling before. So I think it's, um, it's a process and uh, it's getting better and better each day, but the foundation was uh, of course from Mazzini and um, and the, the, the other resurgimental people, Cavour. Uh, Cavour, politically speaking, but culturally speaking, you know, uh, Manzoni and Verdi are perhaps the two most important people for defining us as modern Italians. So I will add a third, and I agree with you. I, there's a lecture I like to give about the three men who created Italy, namely Alessandro Manzoni, the writer, who wrote I Promessi Sposi, which really created the 19th century Italian novel, Giuseppe Verdi, of course, but also a man named Pellegrino Artusi. Pellegrino Artusi was from Romagna, if I remember, I'm not certain. And he traveled around central Italy, a little to the north, a little to the south, and basically followed his nose. Yeah. And if he smelled good food, he would knock on the door. He was a very charming man, apparently and greet the woman of the house and talk to her about what she was cooking. And he documented these foods so that you were talking before about Parma and Reggio Emilia, 22 kilometers apart, 15 miles. And Artuzzi would look at tortelli, which are folded pasta in Parma, and then go to Reggio Emilia and discover the similarities and differences. And he's the one who documented how regional and local Italy could be. Manzoni yes. created unification of language, Verdi unification of spirit, but it was Pellegrino Artuzzi who also became the person who explained Italian regional and local differences, which are part of Italy's great charm and richness. If everything were the same everywhere, like the internet, that would not be such a good thing. Um, Outside of Italy, I think that many people prefer Puccini to Verdi. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of them. Puccini himself said that Verdi was the great composer, and he was right. Puccini was a great composer, let's not be mistaken. But I know that in the United States and England, certainly in America, Puccini is much preferred for many, many reasons. One of them being that when Puccini was Affermato, when he was the great living composer, and Toscanini, who we will get to, was the great conductor. Both of them made a lot of recordings and broadcast in New York. So these went everywhere. And Puccini was heard on the radio. And my parents heard Puccini's music live from the Metropolitan Opera on the radio when they were children. And we didn't hear Verdi as much. We heard Aida, we heard Traviata, Rigoletto, a few things, but we didn't hear the great canon of Verdi. For an American, where we're a society that tends to talk about the individual rather than society, if you focus on Tosca, Mimi, Chocho San, uh, Suor Angelica, all these individual characters, they become the focus. And to an American, that sort of captures the imagination. To an Italian, there's the complexity, the sort of quadro, the frame, the whole painting. So a Verdi opera like Don Carlo or Simone Bocanegra, where you have interlocking relationships, as you said, family dramas. It's not about the individual. We don't know who Tosca's parents were. We don't know anything about her family. With Verdi, we know the family. With Rigoletto, the most famous line for me is when uh, he says, Gilda, dove mia Gilda, where is my daughter? E tutta la mia famiglia. She's my entire yes. family. 
because his wife had died. That that is so verity. That is so Italian. A, a la familia. She, this girl is my entire family. So we know that she's going to die, Gilda. He doesn't yet. Um, and we already know we feel sad for what's going to happen because we understand that. Italians, this is Manzoni, the novelist, but also it's just the way Italians live their lives, in my view, that the family connections and the the cose non dette, the things that are not spoken, but that are felt, that are so much a part of Italian life, Verdi created in his music as a tessuto, as a kind of fabric. Sure, yeah. Whereas Puccini, who wrote gloriously beautiful music, but it was always focused on one character, almost always focused on one character and everyone around her. So when I tell people who love Verdi, if they want to get into Puccini, they should listen to Tosca because Tosca is political, it's more dramatic. People who love Puccini, I tell them to listen to La Traviata because it's about one individual basically. And yeah. that's the way in to connect people who love one composer to the other. But I remember many, many years ago, I was in Reggio Calabria in Southern Italy. And I asked a guy, I didn't know what I was just talking about music as I always do. I, I said, who's your favorite composer? He said, well, Verdi, of course. And I said, why? And he said, because he was our composer when Italy became Italy. In other words, in 1861, in the 1860s to 1870, when the unification of Italy happened. And he speaks, he very speaks for Italians, as you say. And I feel it's unfortunate that young Italians are disconnected from him. They find the tableau, the stories a little too complicated. Also Verdi, unlike Puccini and certain other composers, set all but one of his operas in the past as allegories. So that if you watch Nabucco in ancient times or Lombardi in the middle ages or Ivespri Siciliani in 1282, you're seeing Verdi make references to the present by using the past. Only La Traviata is contemporary. And it was about the hypocrisy in his current society. That's why he had troubles with Umbarlo in Mascara because he, he was very, you know, um, uh, feeling uh, feeling uh, unconfident with with uh, translating that that kind of uh, historical uh, happening to to another place and another country. Well, he faced incredible censorship all the time, and he battled with censors. So that Rigoletto was originally about a king who was killed or attempted to kill him, and then it was sort of reduced to a, a duke in a provincial city of Mantua, beautiful city, but not. France. Um, Balo and Mosca, as you said, was about the assassination of a Swedish king, but they moved it to Boston because Boston was very exotic to Italians, so yeah. it didn't, didn't have the same feeling. But um, my favorite of the Verdi censorship stories is Giovanna d'Arco, Joan of Arc, where he had said it in France and the story we know of Joan of Arc. But when it was brought to Rome to be performed, uh, the Vatican censors said that um, Joan of Arc was a saint uh, or about to be sainted and was a Christian woman and you cannot depict her that way. So they reset it on the island of Lesbos in Greece and she was a warrior. It had nothing to do no, no. with the story that Verdi wrote. And Throughout his life, Don Carlo, Don Carlos was subject to censorship. It was really just Otello and Falstaff that did not really have to deal with censors. Aida differently. Aida was a bit of, I see Aida as, as a much underappreciated opera, even though it's very famous, because it was produced first in Egypt in 1871. And then in February of 1872, it was produced in Milan at La Scala, and Verdi changed some of the ending so that Amneris um, repeats the words pace, 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 because Verdi was concerned that the new Republic of Italy was already tearing apart. 
and he was trying to introduce this concept of peace over civil war. So I mention all this, number one, because I'm very passionate about it, but number two, because I think that people need to study history a little more yeah. to understand yeah. what's in these operas, and people don't want to be bothered. They would rather just see Tosca jump off a building. <laughs> <laughs> Or Mimi die of a cough or Madame yeah. Butterfly kill herself. <laughs> it's easier. You know, it feels yeah. more dramatic and, and so on. It's very dramatic. I'm not complaining about Puccini. <laughs> but approaching Verdi takes a lot more work and a lot more study. I think it's, um, it's um, you know, growing up process, even in terms of um, music history path, uh, Rossini, uh, sorry, Puccini is more is more modern in terms of the harmonies, and uh, it, it tends to treat more love topic than than what Verdi does. Uh, one of the most fascinating thing uh, about about Verdi, I think, is uh, his love for political affairs, for political uh, um, events to, to treat into his operas, and is always able to um, to to sort out. The interesting aspect, the interesting side of uh, of these political events, uh, which is quite a, a rarity in uh, in for an opera composer, because uh, you know it's uh, composers before him always found that political uh, topics were very boring for the audiences, and uh, it's a very courageous act, I think, for a composer to put uh, political things into an opera. When we think about Edwis Foscari, for example, uh, he was complaining, uh, I mean, I'm talking about Verdi, he was complaining about um, the fact that his operas got only one color, only one tinta. And he was quite right, because uh, that political um, drama, the political tension, which is very interesting, but tends to get boring after a while for the audience. And uh, still nowadays, when you perform it, it's one of the most uh, difficult operas uh, of Verdi to, under to understand for the audience. I mean, um, it has, musically speaking, some, some, some very nice moments, but um, since the beginning to the end, you have the, the feeling that uh, you're not quite understanding what it's, what's happening, you know, in the, in the, in the drama. Um, That's like Il Trovatore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know it's what's going fine. on. Yeah, what's happening? <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> yeah. I recognize that it's some of his best music. And what's interesting about Il Trovatore was it was the only opera he wrote until Falstaff that did not have a commission. No. He did it because he was interested in the subject matter and so on. And I don't ever second guess Verdi if he knew what he was doing. But I always try to understand why, what was it in Il Trovatore that so completely inspired him? Unfortunately, the librettist of that opera died and someone else had to complete it. It had its problems, except the music, it's glorious. Mm -hmm. And you hear that Verdi unquestionably was deeply inspired. Yes. And so I, I, I keep studying yeah. Il Trovatore to understand that. That's the joy of these things is that each one of these masterpieces, we could just study one for a whole lifetime, but we get to study many and mm -hmm. go back and learn more about them. As I said, and I've said before, you're a young man. So I know that when you come back to some of these operas later in life, they will have all kinds of additional meanings to you whether it's Simone Bocanegra or Falstaff, there are some of the works that are the works for an older man. Ricardo Muti didn't touch Simone Bocanegra until he was very much More older. 40, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I think he just felt he was not ready to understand that. And here was Verdi, well, he was a genius, creating these things that require work and I, I i come back to that because i that's my concern for you but also for those of us who love verdi that he's not easy to communicate he's emotionally very accessible but i think that if people don't understand the backgrounds and they don't understand the relationships uh famously in don carlo where uh carlo at midnight is in the garden with rodrigo and he thinks he's meeting Elizabeth, but actually it's the Princess Eboli who shows up. And Eboli lifts her veil to kiss Carlo, and he sort of goes, 
oh, thinking oh, that he was the audience laughs because they think she's ugly. It's none of that. It's that politically he was supposed to have this quiet private meeting with the queen, and instead there was a conniving princess. All of this is history. And unfortunately, young people and even not so young people don't like studying history. And so I'm, I bring this back to you because I want to know how you foresee finding the way in. I love what you said about the prelude of Attila, but there are going to be many more like that. How do you make certain all operas of Verdi meaningful to a younger person? Well, I think, um, you know, sometimes we tend to, to forget that uh, Verdi needs to be explained to, to people and not only to young, young people, I mean, even in general. Uh, and uh, it's pretty much for the reasons, as you, as you said before, um, because it's not easy to understand most of times. And it's not because of hits music, which is quite accessible, but because of the contents. And uh, I think uh, more and more we, um, we divulgate him, we divulgate his uh, inspirational word, and especially the fact that it was coming from two very contrasting words in his uh, early age. So on one side, we've got the church, because he grew up learning music actually into a church as an organist, and uh, he absorbed uh, all the, 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 the liturgic music from, um, from his teacher, in the in the church uh, in Roncole Roncole Verdi, and Aunt Andrea is that what it's called? I think. Um, no, it was a, it was a, mm, the Angelo. Back... There's an A somewhere. Yes, maybe Sant'Angelo, Arcangelo, San Michele Arcangelo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And on the other side, you, you have actually the the Wind Symphony Band, uh, because um, because uh, you know he was brung up to listening this uh, these musical representations each week um, by his parents or even by his mecenate and um, so uh, it um, it has really has these two contrasting words and when you explain Verdi to young generation you have to tell them that he grew up by absorbing two very contrasting cultures um, then he put them all together uh, when he was when he was a young man, and I think you can pretty much uh, feel the presence of the wind bands in the early operas. That's why little by little it tends to dismiss um, uh, the banda in palcoscenico or um, you know other other stage band, the on stage band, yeah, the on stage band. Sorry, and uh, the um, for example the other uh, very bandistic orchestration. Uh, for example, it tends to dismiss uh, very high flutes or um, chimbas or instruments which uh, he didn't love anymore in, in the later years of his career. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, I think uh, Verdi needs to be explained. Um, Verdi needs to be um, nurtured by, by, by the conductors who love them in a very specific way and with a very special uh, accent on his life in order to be understood because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't lucky, you know, he, he was born into a very poor family. So <laughs> somehow, aside from, from the help of, uh, of Barezzi, which was his mecenate, but uh, he didn't have help, help, help from anybody else. I'll just mention so, Antonio Barezzi was the father-in-law of Verdi. His daughter, Barezzi's daughter, Margherita, Verdi taught the piano to he taught her Idue Foscari. In fact, when they married, they had two children, Virginia and Icilio. And in 18 months, between 1838 and 1840, both children and Margarita, the wife, died of typhus. And Verdi suddenly found himself with no family at the age of about 27, except for his own parents, his sister, who were a bit distant, and Antonio Barezzi, who really became his mentor and sponsor and helped Verdi along. But it was an unusual relationship because both men lost Margarita yes. and the family. So that's why when you hear Rigoletto say, e tutta la mia famiglia, she's my entire family. 
that that is all, all the relationships you've seen, Verity, you can, without being too much of a psychologist, you can experience this personal life. Yes. And it's in that music in a way that you just, if you have a heart, you, you can't help but notice it. So you were talking about having conductors who are sensitive to Verdi and know how to present him. I think it's safe to say that one of the very greatest was Arturo Toscanini. And Toscanini was born in Parma on March 25th of 1867 and grew up poor in a house uh, near the river, near the park and grew up with a strong social consciousness. He studied at the conservatory we spoke about and began, he played the cello and began playing in orchestras at a very young age and famously on tour in Rio de Janeiro, the local conductor engaged for a production of Aida was not good and these Italian musicians didn't like him. And they tried two others locally and they said no. And Scanini stood up and he said, I can conduct this. He was. 20, something like that, not even maybe. And he conducted Aida. 18, 18 or 19. 18, yeah. And he had a huge success and he toured with this Italian orchestra and opera company. And that made his name. Now, the important thing is Verdi was still alive. Verdi was composing Falstaff. And Verdi saw in fellow man from Parma province someone who understood him and could conduct him and had the same strong fiery personality and same strong devotion to Italian culture and the same strong political ethic. And Toscanini, of course, became the bridge from Verdi, who died in 1901, to Leon Cavallo, Mascagni, um, Catalani, especially. Toscanini mm -hmm. was a great advocate for Catalani and Puccini. And so you grew up very close to where Toscanini was born and grew up. What we spoke about the presence and the feeling of Verdi, his aura in Parma. Verdi was not even from Parma, he was from nearby. Toscanini was from right there. Yes. And remains in the memory, died in 1957, of some very older people in Parma who knew him or knew his wife and daughter's children. Um, he, we know about Toscanini that he was away for the fascist era here in New York. Uh, I had a woman on recently who wrote a book about my father, Toscanini and me, about her father who played violin in Toscanini's orchestra and Lucy Johnson is her name. And so for that reason, Toscanini is very much of our era. There are people who knew him still uh, there are descendants. I know one of his daughters, granddaughter, sorry. And um, we feel him in different ways. One of the recordings that you picked was Toscanini rehearsing La Traviata. Why? Well, uh, in one word, because it's uh, pure conducting. Um, I think that way of treating the orchestra, aside from, uh, you know, saying some, some bad words to musicians, which nowadays would be impossible because the technical level is much higher than those days. Um, but in terms of- <laughs> Say a few of those words. A few of those, <laughs> yeah. Those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in terms of, of the <laughs> things that he, he says uh, uh, musically about, about the comprehension of, of the Verdi music, uh, I think is uh, still nowadays is, is stunning and astonishing. Um, because he, 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 can, he can understand the details which uh, even conductors from nowadays uh, can't, can't deliver, I think, uh, in, the, in the best ways. Um, and uh, answering to your question of, of before, why, why is it important for Parma people, I think is, uh, and for me as well, is um, likewise Verdi, but uh, even more is because uh, of integrity during the, the, the fascist regime, you know, and um, quite myself, I had my grandparent was uh, a partisan, partigiano, and he was, uh, he was fighting against uh, fascist regime uh, during those years. So he 
he quite transmitted to me those values and uh, he said to me listen to Toscanini because he's like me you know and uh, I was obviously um, very fascinated about my grandfather because he was fighting you know without almost nothing in the in the woods against uh, uh, German people and and fascists so thinking about Toscanini in that way, like refusing to play uh, fascist uh, him in uh, Teatro Comunale in Bologna and receiving, uh, uh, you know, um, punch or something like this from, uh, from the local Podesta, um, always fascinated me because I, I could uh, mirror myself with those values. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, uh, it's a sort of integrity and um, the ability to, to, to keep your values during your whole life. And uh, he did it because, you know, when he was pushed aside from the regime, he, he decided to, to fly to the United States and pursue his career there. And he never stopped to, to do that. Um, I, as a very small boy, because you were talking about working with very small children, when I was six and seven and eight, I was part of a focus group. In other words, a group of very young people for a different Leonardo, who starts with a B, Leonardo Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein, who taught what he called young people's concerts and classes. Yeah. And I was one of the group of children who would sit in the auditorium at what was then called Philharmonic Hall at Lincoln Center, oh. New York. And he would work with the orchestra and then turn to us and say, this is what Brahms intended here. This is what, um, I'm suddenly forgetting the composer's name, Cherubini. I remember he taught us Cherubini intended there. And do you understand that? And he would refine his language until we six and seven year olds understood it. Okay. And he never spoke down to us. But when you're talking before about the Attila Prelude, he would, for example, play Bach and then play the Supremes, Diana Ross and the Supremes. And you could hear the musical connection from Johann Sebastian Bach to the Supremes. And that the music, the structure of music is really just there. It is what it is. And it's all in the ether. And if suddenly a composer in Detroit in 1964 summons a melody from Bach to put into the mouth of Diana Ross, yes. that works. And um, Bernstein, Leonardo Benazzi Bernstein, we're going to put it all together. Um, this is how that happens, is that this, I believe, this connection to yourself and your greater society. Verdi depicted it. Toscanini understood it and yes. lived it. He used the communications means that he had available, uh, radio primarily, but also occasionally recordings. Sure. And let's not forget that in the period when Toscanini was here in New York, as the dominant conductor, or one of the dominant conductors, Leonard Bernstein was a very young man. Yes. Leonard Bernstein was born in 1918 and made his debut with the New York Philharmonic in 1943 on a radio broadcast. And it became very famous. And Toscanini knew Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein, I mean, everybody knew and saw Toscanini. There were, of course, Bruno Valtra and many other fine conductors here as well, Leopold Stokowski. But Toscanini was at a different level because of his political engagement and his conducting skills. And in effect, in New York, at least, the handoff of the baton, mm -hmm. musical and otherwise, yes. was Toscanini to Bernstein, to Bernstein, which is not what people typically think. It's what I think. But that meant by the early 1960s, when I was a very little boy, I was able to hear this connection from Bernstein, Toscanini, Puccini, Verdi. And the line goes all the way back. Sure. And similarly, you as a conductor have studied with many great conductors in your young life. 
and you are now part of their line. So I know Ricardo Muti, Michele Mariotti, who's still quite a young man himself, Mark Elder, Simon Rattle, Semyon Bishkov. There are others you've studied with. Do you see yourself as part of this river, so to speak? Well, first this, of all, thank you very much for your kind of words. Um, well, I'm only wishing you luck, but you, <laughs> you did study with these people. <laughs> no, I, I, I pretty much feel in, uh, in, in, that, in that stream. And um, I think uh, history of music is not, is not narrowed by, you know, countries or, or, or cultures. I mean, it's, it's depicted by cultures, but it's not property of one culture instead of another one. And of course, we have uh, three major reference countries, I think, for music making is uh, Italy, Germany, Russia, and uh, well, in, in, in a more little part, I think, France as well. But these are the Whoa. core. <laughs> yeah. Russia, yes. No, no, no. <laughs> um, the United States was not initially well, a classical music country, but it is the country where everything melds. Absolutely. And the African-American tradition and the um, music specifically of West Africa and the pentatonic scale came here and helped form jazz and all the great music of African Americans, plus the Jews from Eastern Europe, plus the Irish and the Scots and the Italians and Latin Americans and their wonderful music and their melodies. So I know it often happens that people say that America has no culture. We no. have our own very distinctive musical culture that is a bit a product of the rest of the world, but made greater. The fact that, for example, George Gershwin and Duke Ellington lived at the same time and were born at the same time and were these magnificent composers and artists who knew and understood one another. And Gershwin understood Ravel and Duke Ellington understood Edvard Grieg. Cole Porter um, as well. Yeah. Pardon me? Cole Porter as well. Is Cole Porter as well. But they all blended here, sure. specifically in places yeah, that's, like that's New exactly York, Detroit, what Nashville, New Orleans. Yeah. And exactly so, yes, not to leave out the United States, but certainly I agree with you that the Germanic tradition, the symphonic tradition, the Italian operatic and string tradition, the great Russian choral tradition, but also the virtuoso pianists and so on. But France, United Kingdom, there are other places. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't leave out France too quickly, but um, I agree with you completely that it doesn't belong to one country. No. And, but do you see yourself as an Italian conductor, as a conductor, as someone who was born and raised in the Parma tradition, but not necessarily just of Italian music? Mm -hmm. How do you okay. see yourself? I, I see that sometimes I feel myself like I have um, a lot of uh, weight on my shoulders because uh, we we are we are trying to to recap with uh, with uh, that of great artists in the past. So uh, the duty is not easy in uh, in these words. Um, but yes, of course I feel uh, a lot of responsibility exactly because of that. And um, I don't I don't tend to forget the lesson I've learned. From, from these giants from the past, but I think it's a, it's an ongoing process. And I personally don't, don't believe so much that uh, music needs to be modernized so much, uh, you know, and conductors need to, to, to be modernized or modernized music which he conducts. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, nowadays the, the, the duty of the, the modern conductor is perhaps connecting with the, the, the modern sound, which technically speaking is possible to express like Karian, uh, did in uh, his career, for example, or uh, or even Bernstein, because he was he was very fascinated about technical processes as well, um, but not uh, by uh, lowering the uh, musical offer to the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. So, which means um, I don't I don't believe that the conductor should um, uh, should be technically speaking uh, um, like anybody else. You know, he needs to be prepared technically speaking and uh, musically and historically and even uh, uh, culturally speaking. So yes, I, I 
I very much feel the presence of these conductors of the past, and I hope to to reconnect with their works and to uh, to keep my my career by by um, recapping with their steps. When I speak to artists such as you, especially Italians, but not only, I often ask them what a particular teacher taught them or made an impression on them. I'll give you one example. The wonderful Italian baritone Ambrogio Maestri, who is a great Falstaff, who did his first Falstaff actually in Busetto, in the little theater in Busetto, conducted by Riccardo Muti with Barbara Fritelli as, as um, what's her name? Ford, Alice Ford. And um, Muti worked with this wonderful cast in this very small theater. And Maestri told me that Muti told him to be sensitive to the words and that the acting and the humor is in the words and the music and not in his acting. And mm -hmm. to don't act like a fat man, don't act like a drunk man, don't act like a flirtatious man. Be faithful to what the words and the music by Boito and by Verdi uh, present and then just make that your foundation yes. for building your character. So is there anything particular in studying with Ricardo Muti that you learned as a lesson for your approach to music? Well, um, it is exactly what you mentioned uh, in the first place. Uh, so it's uh, always mm, keeping the eye between the connection uh, of the word and music, but always the deep uh, respect that uh, we have to to have with the with Verdi, not just um, as a as a creator of beautiful melodies, but um, by respecting his uh, his musical message, which, uh, as you said before, sometimes is quite uh, underlying the the notes, and so to to get beyond the notes and understand the his music by um, the link between the words and the music and the characters sometimes, uh, you know, I think the the most typical mistake with Verdi is that uh, the singers quite too loud and the music is played too softly. Or uh, um, well, is that the conductor's fault or the singer's fault? I think both. I think both. Um, mainly conductor because conductor needs to train uh, singers and not the opposite way. So um, the conductor needs to, to train uh, singers properly and uh, to make them understand when something is it's needed to be played softer and with a more soft attitude. Um, so yes, I think uh, the main lesson I've learned from, uh, from Muti is um, to giving the respect that most of times, uh, especially abroad from Italy, uh, Verdi receives from from uh, interpreters and uh, other conductors, mm, which doesn't mean is a is a is a mistake. Of course, is uh, sometimes is uh, also tradition and a bad one, bad tradition, I have to say. But uh, as an Italian conductor, I pretty much uh, feel the duty of uh, of um, correcting this these bad uh, habits. Um, you know, and uh, I really, I really want to to do that in my in in my career because uh, Verdi, as as Mozart or uh, or Beethoven or other very important German composers, and uh, needs the respect that uh, that the, the interpreters gave them in the past. So, so when um, Verdi, for example, wrote. Aida, and in the sextet at the end, I believe sextet, at the end of the second act, Maria Callas and more recently Aprile Milo took it to a high E flat, completely above everyone else. And it's very exciting. And I don't complain about that because I liked it, but Verdi didn't write that. No. And similarly in Traviata at the end of the first act, she hits high notes that maybe Verdi didn't write. Um, you called it tradition. In English, we often call it performance practice, that it has evolved this way, that it's not necessarily the right thing. But um, I know that Maestro Muti really is very strong on this topic of doing come scritto as written by the composer. 
uh, let's say one day you're going to be conducting and you'll meet a soprano who says, I can sing that e high E flat and I eat and I intend to do it. What does Maestro Bernazzi say to the singer? <laughs> well, I think that the, the, main, the main thing is to actually understand the context. And uh, if, if the, the, the theater, if the acoustic or, uh, or the place where you're performing um, is, is suggesting you that some, some things could be, could be performed, uh, why not? If it's not, of course, uh, going against too much with, with what the composer wrote. Uh, for example, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't play the detagli, which, uh, which, uh, which are, I, I think, are, are tremendous for very music. This is perhaps more, more uh, dangerous than uh, than the high notes or or stuff like this, uh, because the high note is not is not something that um, leaves something from the composer idea, but detagli, the their cuts, uh, are are more dangerous in my opinion. So. Um, I have a different attitude towards the the, the balletti, which uh, which I think Verdi didn't didn't love so much, but wrote just because the commission were, were pushing him to to write. So, um, so in French operas such as Vespri, Le Vespri Sicilien, Le Vespri Sicilian in Don Carlo, and Jerusalem, which were some of the French language operas, Paris Opera wanted a ballet, so he inserted them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they 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 kind of pushed him to to write this this uh, this uh, um, uh, third music, but he he didn't he didn't love so much this practice, especially in the last years, because he was also um, fascinated about the processes and uh, the the updates that the musical world in German culture was was doing. Uh, an example is that he tend to dismiss in the last operas the word. Uh, um, um, overture instead of preludio. Mm -hmm. It's because preludio is more German, and uh, he feels that somehow he he needs to connect himself with the new generations of composers, and he changes the word uh, um, overture to preludio. You know, uh, actually, it, from the German, it's Vorspiel, which I love that. Vorspiel, yes, because okay. in German food, Vorspeise is what you eat before the meal. Yeah, so. Vorspiele is what you play before the opera. Um, what did you learn particularly from Simon Rattle? And I, I name him for a reason I'll get to, but um, I mean, we can talk about your other conductor teachers as well. I'd be glad to, but there's a reason I'm asking about Simon Rattle. Um, I think the, 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 the great passion that he, he, he puts into any repertoire he gets uh, in touch with. Uh, he's able to to uh, to conduct some uh, some very early music uh, and uh, to pass from it to very uh, late uh, contemporary music uh, with the same uh, serious attitude, which I respect so much. And uh, the fact that he studies so much the scores, of course, um, which you you can think it's quite obvious, but but it's not. Uh, I mean, I, I, there are conductors which which don't study so much. I think. And the quality of, of for Simon Rattle is exactly to to you know to pass from each repertoire by conserving a very serious attitude towards whatever he's conducting. The opera that I've had the most trouble falling in love with is Pelias and Melisande mm -hmm. by Debussy, and I knew I worked with James Levine, and James Levine always said this is one of the greatest operas of all. And I heard Levine conduct it many times and I respected it, but I never quite fell in love with it. When Rattle did it at the Met a few years ago, it's as if I was hearing it for the first time. And Tristan Uni's old opera, I do love, but it's a very tough opera. When I heard him conduct that, it was different from any Tristan I'd heard before. And I've had this experience several times, even Beethoven symphonies with Simon Rattle, that when I hear it, I'm hearing it with new things added. But I'm not saying that he corrupts the work, but I think he finds different things in those notes that I've heard before. And that to me is fascinating. I've never met him or spoken to him, but if I do, that's what I would like to talk to him about. 
Um, did he at all address how to read and study a score? Uh, yes, pretty much so. Um, you know, it starts by by learning the general um, background of the cultural background of the composer, and um, by playing at the piano as well, because he's a, he's a good pianist as well. So he plays the, the entire score at the piano in the first place, and then tends to get to details uh, step by step, uh, which uh, which is something I I, I really like uh, when you approach um, a score or a new one. Or new repertoire because uh, um, you know especially for conductors I see nowadays many conductors are conducting uh, uh, with the cues which is something I don't I don't like at all I have to say explain uh, more what you mean by conducting with the cues yes I mean uh, um, without knowing uh, the score inside out you know because you can pretty much conduct whatever you want with the cues uh, so you can you know where uh, an instrument in um, in the orchestra tends to get in, uh, or at the moment in uh, is getting into playing, and you can conduct it. But if you don't know uh, the harmonical structure or the rhythmical structure or the melodical structure as well, um, you you don't know the piece inside out. In other words, which means that you are conducting, but you're not exactly know what you're conducting. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so you can't deliver your interpretation. You can just deliver some very, very good technical uh, and operativity uh, qualities. Uh, but even uh, even uh, a policeman with the traffic can do this. You know, okay. you can you can beat one and two, three and four. Uh, it's simple. You can you can know where uh, an instrument is uh, is getting to play, but anybody can do it in this way. So uh, I admire another kind of conductor. So I have to be very honest with you about this. Uh, the conductor who does study the score from the beginning and uh, who, who does uh, study note per note. So, um, which means uh, a lot of work, of course, is, is much longer. It's a much longer process and uh, even, even more stressing because uh, each day you're feeling you're fighting with uh, the interpretation of the day before. So, um, it's uh, it's really uh, devastating from some some point of view of view. But uh, at the end of the day, what you have when you are in front of the orchestra is a feeling of uh, of being somehow the the real leader of that interpretation, and not somebody who has been put there by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think is is very important because if you feel you're not in charge when you're conducting, it means that the orchestra can uh, can eat you. Uh, in almost a second, and this this happens quite quite often, you know that you I've you've seen it happen a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Um. You made a point in passing that I want to underline more for our listeners, namely that the conductor, the word in Italian is maestro, which means conductor, but also teacher, historically played a very important role as the teacher of singers. And in the case of symphonic music of orchestra players, but I know that Ricardo Muti historically has done a lot of that. James Levine did it. Um, Georg Schulte did that a lot, where yes. he in effect was the teacher as well as the conductor, because it helped him get the effects that he wanted. And in Schulte's conception, the role, the sound but also the sound of the orchestra had to be all be brought together. Are you, and do you intend to continue to be a teacher of singers in their roles? Because that's a very different and not so common thing nowadays. I think it's a great thing, but the budgeting even of opera companies in terms of the time required mm -hmm. to do a production, whether new or a revival does not always permit that kind of teaching. What's your approach on that? Well, I think uh, more you study before and more or less you have to say to the singers. So, which means the, the process is quite similar to what the one I said before about the orchestral scores. Because uh, if you know the, the singers lines very, very well, then you can spend very little time by correcting them if they're good singers. Because sometimes uh, the the good singers are quite uh, sensitive and clever to understand what they are uh, doing wrong or missing. So if the conductor is exactly picking up that very 
single point where they're doing mistake. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you don't you don't need so much time to do the work well. Um, so, but this is obviously um, a consequence of your personal preparation uh, before when you're studying at home uh, the singer's line and uh, the opera inside out. Mm -hmm. So yes, the time is limited, of course, and um, I don't I don't see myself or the the, the modern conductor as uh, as just teacher or a person who does instruct singers to do that way uh, with a very um, strong attitude or the attitude of a teacher, but more like um, um, traghettatore, I would say in Italian, maybe you can help me with the English word, uh, somebody who, who does help the singers to understand the general uh, context of the opera. So and, does that uh, come from traghetto? Yes. So traghetto is a ferry. Exactly. Um, so the, the man powering the ferry, leading people from one place to the next. Yes. Is that what you mean? Okay. That's a new word for me. <laughs> um, as we wind up, because this has been an interesting and very enjoyable conversation, and I know that for most viewers, it's their first contact with you. Uh, you gave a list of wonderful music, uh, Toscanini rehearsing Verdi and Bowie Toast Mephistopheli, con Echo and Mondo conducted by Julius Rudell, and Verdi's Ernani, which is a wonderful first Verdi opera. But also Emil Gillel's playing Beethoven uh, sonatas and variations on the piano. Yes. Why him? Why that? For example, um, well, I simply because I find uh, him one of the most uh, astonishing pianists in uh, in modern history. Um, the way he plays uh, Beethoven, I think, is uh, is just fascinating. Fascinating because he can deliver that that sort of uh, soft sound which other pianists uh, are not able to um, to to pick up from Beethoven Beethoven music. And those variations are very rare to be found in uh, in any recording, uh, you know, session, uh, almost from other pianists. And I I love the fact that he's Russian. I love the fact that he's um, somehow um, um, contaminated by other cultures when he plays the piano. And you can almost uh, hear that sense of contamination when he plays. So is um, I think is one of the most sensitive pianists. In the in the music history, and that's why I picked him up. So I want to tell listeners that contaminated to an Italian is a good thing. Yes, to an English speaker, it's not necessarily a good thing, but okay. you meant in the positive sense. No, no, it was a positive sense. Yes, and then you picked um, Otto Kleber conducting Beethoven Third Symphony and the Leonore Overtures One and Two, and Mussorgsky's picture at an exhibition conducted by Carlo Maria Giulini. So Klemperer and Giulini, how come? Well, um, I think Klemperer is uh, the prototype of the modern conductor in a way. Um, he, he takes the, the, the testimone from Toscanini and uh, he, he brings the work um, further on. Um, the way I admire him so much when, I, when he conducts is because his stillness when he, when he conducts is almost like uh, moving anything aside from the baton. And uh, you, can, you can pretty much feel that the sound is coming out from the, from the mind and not from the body, uh, which is why I, um, I put in confrontation with the Giulini because Giulini was much more physical in a way and uh, similar to uh, Karajan for the way of he was conducting like uh, body uh, speaking. Uh, but the sound is very strong and neat uh, for both, both of them. And um, I admire uh, for Klemperer the way of delivering the music without almost uh, um, jumps from one bar to the other. You know, you, you, can, you can hear the flow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, and for Beethoven, uh, which is a very vertical music because, you know, Beethoven writes uh, vertically, um, you, can, you can hear that his, his conducting is very, horizontal mm -hmm. and still and uh, you can you can hear that he was he's starting from the beginning and getting to the end almost without jumps in Beethoven especially because it's one of the the the, the challenge for the conductor playing Beethoven in this way so it's not easy uh, to 
try to not put your ego, but uh, understand that the Verdi has, a, sorry, the um, Beethoven had a very strong ego himself. So if you put them together, the result is like a car crashing to the wall sometimes. And you need to be very calm and still to understand that he was uh, so, uh, you know, angry in a way and um, very, very passionate when he was writing music. So you need to use the head and not the body, in other words, mm -hmm. when you conduct Beethoven. And um, the, why, the reason why I picked up Giulini is, uh, is because, um, for, for similar reasons, uh, because you can, you can feel the presence of the man uh, behind, behind the, the, the music he was conducting and uh, pictures of an exhibition is such a misunderstood and misunderstood uh, composition, in my opinion, and the composer as well is one of the most extraordinary we have I, in modern music. Have you ever studied or wanted to conduct Kovancina by Mussorgsky? I studied it. I never conducted it uh, nowadays. But a fabulous opera. And I yeah, think beautiful. if someone conducts Verity well, they could conduct Kovancina well. Yes. The preludio, the, the choral music, all of that. It's very Verity in its way with huge orchestral yes. textures. Of course, Boris Goodenough is a masterpiece. It's in a way like Simone Bocanegra. And I love Boris Goodenough, but Kovanchina is forgotten sometimes. Yes, it is. It's really an amazing work. Well, Leonardo, this is just the beginning. Um, I'm very glad to have met you in this format and to help introduce you to audiences. And we look forward to hearing you and seeing you doing greater things and bringing Verdi and all musicians, but mostly Verdi to the new generation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, for your time and for guesting me, for hosting me, sorry. It was a very nice time spent with you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.